Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging that I'm broadcasting to you from the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I'd like to acknowledge elders past and present and acknowledge that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. My name is Elena Gomez and I am the facilitator of Toolkit's Poetry for Express Media. Um, and tonight I'll be doing our last uh, live session, I think of the year, um, with uh, an incredible poet um, and um, person I deeply admire, uh, Pam Brown. Um, so Pam Brown has been writing, collaborating, editing and publishing in diverse modes for decades now. Several of her many books of poetry have been on the shortlists and have sometimes won the prize. Most recently, Click Here for What We Do, which was published by Vagabond uh, Press, was awarded the ALS Gold Medal in 2019. In 2021, Pam's imprint Never Never Books published her booklet of three long poems called Endings and Spacings. Pam has earned a living variously and spent a long period working in a sciences library at Sydney University. She lives on Gadigal land, Eora Nation. So we'll be speaking to Pam in a minute, um, but I just also wanted to give an overview of this program. Um, so Toolkits is a 12 week program for writers aged 30 and under to develop their skills in a unique and exciting online environment. Toolkits is run by Express Media and Express has been around for over 30 years. It's a long time, wow, <laughs> amazing. Uh, developing, supporting and promoting young writers through workshops that develop skills through opportunities for constructive feedback and publication, such as VoiceWorks, and also through awards and programs that recognize excellence. So Toolkits is an online program with participants from all over Australia. And as I mentioned, tonight is our last session for 2021. Um, so the program is presented in partnership with Australian Poetry and is generously supported by the Copyright Agency Cultural Fund. This session is going to go up onto YouTube afterwards as a resource and it's going to be captioned in the coming days. If you'd like to ask any questions, you can uh, do that on Twitter and the hashtag is hashtag EM Toolkits or you can use the live chat section on YouTube. Um, and we love questions, ask lots of questions. Um, this is a great opportunity to hear from Pam. Um, so tonight, uh, I've sort of loosely called this session The Lives of Poets. Um, I really just wanted to have Pam on because I'm a huge fan of her poems and just thought we have a lot to learn. Um, and so The Lives of Poets kind of is the overarching idea here, but um, we're going to talk a bit about a few different aspects of poetry practice. Um, and kind of the history of Australian poetry and the kind of role of community um, and all sorts of things um, that come up. Uh, but uh, I'm going to throw to Pam now. And Pam, uh, did you want to just say hello and maybe start us off with a poem or two? Yeah. Um, well, hello, whoever you are. Um, I, I, first of all, I'll acknowledge, uh, Elena just said the, the, in my bio that I live on the uh, the stolen land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, um, and I pay my respects to them. I have a poem called Scenes. What's graspable on the starless night of the blackout as the gleaming cars snake cautiously up around that hillside curve is the way the absence of streetlight suggests the past. Not a past I ever knew, but one I make up tonight. A boy slides through it on a silver scooter, coming back from synagogue, curly tails dangling beneath an embroidered yarmulke, perched like a lid to imagination's reckless feats or dimmer prospects, sets of fraying notebooks filled with scripture. Over the road, two very stone spectres can't figure out how to turn off the one working headlight on their old silver BMW. So they leave it on and hurry off on foot, jerkily, on pills probably, 
fags attached to lower lips, flat battery, a portent. An intense white light shines down through folding greys on the isolated city. It transforms to a plastic model, to a distant maquette like toys on my horizon. That white plastic bag has been drifting from the gutter to the road for three days. When the rainwater carries it off to the Tasman Sea, I think I'll miss it. That was scenes. <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much. Uh, Would you like so a much... shorter one? Will I do a shorter one and then yeah. talk about it? I don't know. No, do, yeah, let's hear another one. That sounds great. Okay. Well, this is a more recent one. Um, it's, I have a book coming out. I might, I'll just get right to that um, in November, but it was written, it's called Stasis Shuffle, which sounds like a pandemic title, you know, but actually it was finished two years ago before the pandemic and it's been sitting waiting to get some air. Um, so this is one book from that, which is a bit more recent than that other one. And it's just, it's a shorter one called Dust, Dust Coat. Lucky to find some illustrated tablets beneath a heap of splotchy index cards. Never begin a sentence with indeed, says the Karawong through a beak full of pecorino. Bottles and bottles of ethanol stack sideways at the lab. Nothing hurts like the moth we pin. Dust on the dust coat. Assistant pay too low for pay as you go. Flip flop flap. Conditions apply. They wanted you to pay to look at the sky. Telescopic nightlight robbery. Used to pay to comply, keep quiet. Oh no, not can't complain, says the cockroach, nibbling dried chanterelle. That's the end. <laughs> I, w I should say, I borrowed a line from, there's, there's a line in there, they wanted you to pay to look at the sky, and I should confess that I borrowed that from a Melbourne singer called Georgia Mack. So ah, I confess. Yes. <laughs> and Pope, yes. Oh, um, I think there's something really, there's something quite gathering in those poems. They sort of feel like they're gathering lots of things or kind of observing I don't know. That, yeah, those are really great poems to start us off with. Thank you. I feel like um, it's always a real treat to hear you read your work as well. Um, so, Thank yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Um, okay. So I'm going to ask a kind of intro broad question um, just to, like, tell us a bit more about yourself. So um, could you maybe give us a bit of your background, like, as a poet, um, when you started writing, how did you come to poetry as a form? And uh, who were the poets that you were reading first? Mm. Well, um, I've, I've kind of done it all my life, which I know sounds like a kind of brag, but isn't, because I started off writing lists when I was a little kid at about seven. I just started making these lists that were fantasies of what I might have if we had any money, which we didn't have. <laughs> So I think that began because they were actually, you know, vertical like a poem. Um, but really I started later in, I suppose, what you call junior high school. Um, I went to high school in Brisbane and I think I started to write proper poems then. And, and we read for, from an anthology. We read poems from an anthology that was designed for students in those days. So it was, um, it was pretty mostly white, UK, American some South African, or sort of Commonwealth, but also other other places and Australians, um, and that was kind of the the junior reading, and then and then we moved on to the Victorians and the, and the Romantics, which I quite liked, um, you know, old serious old Tennyson and things like that. Um, but I, I also remember in the junior time we we had a poem by Judith Wright, which I can't actually remember. I can't remember which one, but. I started to copy that. So instead of writing really, um, it became more, more, things became more complicated. So I started to copy what she did to try and write a more substantial poem, whatever a teenager thinks that is, you know. And uh, that was an influence. But I would say, mentioning Judith Wright, that I was also aware of Kath Walker, who's now known as Ujiru Nunakal, because 
um, of my friendship at school. My best friend was a young communist and her parents were, um, uh, they were communists. Her mother was from Vienna, uh, Jewish, and her father was an Australian historian. And um, um, Ujiru and, and, and Eva were in the Union of Australian Women. So I, I knew them and was aware of her first book and that. So that was kind of completely out of curriculum. Um, and then, and, and I think it, I think it's interesting to remember that, you know, that she's such an important person now, even though she's um, passed away. Uh, but anyway, then then I guess I strayed from the curriculum entirely because it didn't seem that interesting and started reading The Beats, which um, was kind of um, Allen Ginsberg, um, Gregory Corso, Diane de Prima, Anne Waldman, those crazy people, and they were very exciting compared with what we'd been doing um, in school. So that was right off offbeat. And, and I also like French at school more than English. And so, of course, um, he wasn't taught, but I, but I discovered, of course, Rambo, you know, um, Apollinaire, um, Paul Valéry, um, and started to, uh, my French, my French and English scores were okay, but I started to read those things rather than concentrate on maths or anything. And things went a little bit haywire. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then I found some Europeans in, there used to be these things that Penguin put out, which were series of European and, you know, international writers. And I discovered this wonderful poet from Serbia called Vasco Popa. And um, you might have heard of the Czech poet Miroslav Holub. He's, he's um, probably more famous. And then I discovered Mayakovsky, Vladimir Mayakovsky, um, which really set me on a different path to do with the form and everything because his poems his longer poems used to cascade down the down the page and he i mean i still really enjoy reading him i've read him all my life and can go you can go back you know some poets have a real long shelf life so i think that's kind of the beginning and then i i don't think i can continue for the whole <laughs> <laughs> no, that's really great thank you um it's really interesting to hear like the sort of the range of poets that you came to um, at different times and mm. the different ways they would have influenced your own writing. Um, also, I think it's interesting, like, important to recognise the kind of outside curriculumness of your poetry kind of education where it was through friends and it was through connections and through people that you were meeting that you found these poets to read as well, um, like self-discovery. Um, yeah, so well, my friend um, Barbara the Communist, who was also a folk singer and in Eureka Youth League, you know, it was of the times, um, um, we used to write poems to each other about things that, like, you know, teenage things that were really kind of um, upsetting or, you know, meaningful and sad usually. <laughs> um, and, but so, and also her family gave me a lot of, um, um, they, I found out a lot from them that was completely nothing I'd, I'd ever discovered before um, because her father had been to like Indonesia and and they had Indonesian things and her mother played, you know, of course, Rachmaninoff and piano. And so it was a very different, they were very influential and I think more influential than, you know, formal education. It was really good for, for yeah. that period. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, there was something you said earlier about things got more complicated and I was, what you just described about writing poems to each other as teens, I just wondered if those things were connected. Um, but I've maybe just done that in my own mind so we don't have to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when things get complicated. Um, the best time to write poetry is when things get complicated. Um, That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to... Yeah, yeah. Sorry, my um, phone just, I'm just put my phone off, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay, that's okay. Um, yeah. I wanted to come to your poetry um, in terms, so I'm just going to 
quote from Michael Farrell because um, he reviewed Click Here for what we do for Sydney Review of Books. Um, mm. And I, I liked this line. He says, Brown's poetry suggests reading as an active process, the poem being made as you read, not the poem waiting for your interpretation. Um, I think that's very on point, but also I kind of like this idea of the poem being made as you read. So I'm just wondering um, about your poetry's intention when it comes to its readers, um, if there is one, uh, or if not, how do you conceptualise the reader's relationship to your poems? Um, do you well, find that it changes after you've written it or is there something going on while you're composing? Hmm. Feel free to ignore parts of that if you want. No, and I, I think I, I, I'm saying I started off with no because I'm not conscious <laughs> of any intention towards a reader. Um, when I'm making a poem, but I think a lot of poets would say the same thing because it's it's sort of mysterious. I think it's mysterious. It's not quite as abstract as being a painter or something, you know, where you just go sort of direct line to unconscious and put something on the canvas. But it's a bit like that. It's like um, I think I compile poems rather than write them, you know, and um, I, this, that's more now, like Michael's talking about, Michael Farrell's talking about something, uh, book, you know, a book from 2018. But before that, there's I've done a lot of, in my younger days, a lot of sort of um, feisty standalone poems that used to end with maybe a punchline of some kind or, you know, a retort or things like that, um, which I used to think were Pam Brown poems after a while and got really tired of doing that. So it evolved into this more fragmentary, process um, which I guess is what Michael's talking about that you can um, it is like the reader can it's it's almost like long page turners or something the reader can go along as it as the poem I wasn't going to say builds because it doesn't really build anything but as the poem moves I guess with those fragments you know yeah. um, and now I leave them I'll just say that I leave them more open-ended like sometimes I just leave poems hanging now you know and they don't have that conclusive thing that I used to do which there's nothing that, you know there's nothing wrong with that it's just what I do like I think some yeah. great conclusions would be wonderful especially in form you know like um like um maybe sonnets or or um a form that has that sort of conclusive retort at the end you know but I, yeah. I don't know. So I think that it's for the reader, but they can, I, th I think really a reader can make of it whatever they like. And that's, that's kind of open, you know. I think that's, yeah, I think that's it, right? It's um, kind of trusting the reader with the poem and whether it's conscious or not, because I think, yeah, you're right, when we're composing poems, how do we, we're not necessarily... And every poet's different, so I don't want to kind of speak for all poets. Mm, but absolutely. It's a suggestion of whether whether or not you're imagining a reader or whether or not you're thinking about what that is. And it's really hard to do that in the composition of something mm. because you are just sort of focused on what's in front of you. Um, but I think that's interesting what you've said about how you used to write and this idea of what the Pam Brown poet used to be, poem mm. used to be, um, and that mm. changing. Because um, that suggests to me that there's some kind of, understanding of what the poems are doing or at least the voice that you're developing and one thing I've noticed in your I mean I'll, I'll have a question about this later but I think that sort of kind of lines up with how I've sort of read your poetry as well that there's it's quite um it never stays the same it doesn't it's not ever mm -hmm. kind of like you said before it's not building mm -hmm. as such there's sort yeah. of something else going on in the shape of it I think, um, I mean, I, I think we change. I think, of course, you know, we change every decade, really, in a way. Not not literally every decade, but, you know, every 10 years or so, if you live long enough, you, 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 you change gradually. And I think, you know, I've been like, you know, Pamela Brown, Coca-Bola, a sort of character Brown, <laughs> um, punky kind of thing, and then Pam Brown. And so I think, I think the I don't feel that I'm the person who wrote those early poems or earlier poems. I stand by them and I can look at them and I quite like that person in a way. But it's, you, you know, you move on from um, things and it's not a conscious, I don't think I've ever tried to consciously change what I'm doing. 
I think that would be really hard, you know. I mean, a formalist could do that, like someone who writes, you know, formal poems. They could say, I'm sick of doing these, I'm going to do a sestina or something, you know, um, which is really difficult poem to write. I mean, but, yes, I think you change in life and so does what you do when you're making, you know, poems or art or whatever. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I think there's some definitely... Um, yeah. That. And, and you may not, I mean, there may be some people who don't like what you're doing as you go along, but that's, <laughs> what can you do about that? You know, they might have preferred this kind of feisty, punky feminist <laughs> you know, or whatever. I mean, there's <laughs> poems always, still there for them if they want to read them. You can never, you can... never say, oh, she's mellowed. Never. <laughs> oh, no, we can't say that. That's, <laughs> no. Um, but I, yeah, I think there's, um, like, the world is also changing, right? Like, you're changing <laughs> the world around yes. you. So what mm. kind of things you're responding to or kind mm. of having, being affected by that might go into your poetry is also changing. Um, I, just jumping across a little bit, sorry, I don't mm -hmm. have smooth transitions between these questions. Sometimes I just have to go into the next one. Um, but uh, I'm going to talk a bit about, uh, I guess community. So, um, in there was a an interview you did with John Kinsella in Jacket, um, and you were talking. I think there was a question about your position as a poet alongside other poets of your generation. Um, and I think you said something about being like outside the committee of the new, which is just a phrase that I really liked. Um, but you're kind of situating yourself in the context of these um, poets. Um, and that's the sort of setup of this question, but I was just wondering, um, how do you how do you think about community? And what, like, I think the, what what John Kinsella was also saying in that interview was speaking to like aesthetic collectives and kind of groups yeah. grouping, like loose, informal but kind of uh, intentional groupings. Um, I just wondered what your thoughts are on community and aesthetic collectives in Australian poetry. If you see them as different or interchangeable or yeah and maybe how that's changed i have i guess i don't know quite my motivation but i've been in lots of groups in the time i've been alive you know groups that are always kind of um like i mean they have they have purpose rather than they're not just social they are social as well which is nice but you know but um I think it comes from the background, I think, comes from like the, the 70s ethics and, and like people um, having not having much money and living in share houses and group houses and so on. That's already something where you have to deal with everybody's wishes and all of that, um, you know, uh, and get on with each other in, in a situation that isn't a family situation or anything like that. And um, so I think it started then and, and um, like early on there were things like, um people I lived in a house where someone was coming out Paul my friend was coming out as being gay and so we he he brought Camp Inc into our house which was a group that the, an organization that was um camp stood for um campaign against moral persecution and that was an organization that was fighting for gay rights you know and I think that was my first um uh kind of encounter with with that Oh, you know, what's Paul doing in the lounge room? <laughs> you know? um, and that was really interesting. But then also I then became, um, I got into a women's band, um, which was uh, called Clitoris Band, which is, you know, famously, um, anyway, we got into lots of trouble. But um, it was it was one of the early women's bands in Australia and there were then a, quite a few because what happened was, you know, Women's Liberation, the second, the second wave came along. So that affected everybody really. Um, and I'm just going on about that to give you kind of an idea of why you might, why I might be drawn to collectives, you know, because also Women's Liberation had lots of collectives because there'd be something that would be socially disagreeable. We'd have to discuss it. So we'd have a meeting and they were famous for people knitting through them and all this kind of um, women's culture, you know. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, and so after that I was in an anarchist feminist uh, theatre group called the Lean Sisters and then I was um, uh, in a, then a group of women writers called 
um, no regrets. And we formed because being outside the committee, if you like, um, we formed to counter the lack of equal representation of women poets and writers in readings and publications. It was a very, very male Australian literary scene and or, or writing scene and like um, we thought we'd have to do something about that, so we did. <laughs> Um, and we'd also, the thing was, we also had lots of differences and we could discuss them and, you know, um, it affected, our, we, we could affect each other's work without, I mean, sometimes there'd be great arguments, but also there was a really terrific um, social aspect to it as well. And we also did some readings, raised some money and made a publication, that kind of thing, you know. Um, so I think... And also, I was, you know, there was a tin sheds, this place where all the radical posters were made, and I'd go and make posters, and we do our theatre there, and all that. Um, so I think that's just to me, um, it was a natural kind of thing to be an art, use the arts as activism, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess it's not, it's not, it's changed enormously. Like those sorts of things don't happen, but I think there's a great nostalgia for it, and I see. Um, a lot of younger people kind of looking for that and producing things that to me remind me of that time, which I think is really great. So I think community, although I, I do love a quip by um, the poet and philosopher Justin Clemens who said the poetry community is a community of people with nothing in common. And I think he's right because it's like this whole sort of, jumble of differences, you know, um, yes. and it is a community, but it's not, you know, people think communities are always harmonious and I'm not sure that's the case. Um, it's definitely not the case. And I think uh, a, um, like a downside of a community would be if it was completely homogenous. Um, mm. The point, um, but you, you mean something different. Oh no, I was I was just going to go back to the committee idea, but that's sort of like the formal structures that we have that are to do with government funding, and that's what I call the committee, you know. Um, and I've always been terribly suspicious. Uh, I, I mean, I've had, I've kind of you, you get involved in it because you, you know, people ask you to do things, but it's like I really don't like that kind of. Um, I really don't like the whole, I mean, I don't even, even though I've been a judge and everything, I don't really even like prize culture, you know, because the, the sort of competition, I mean, it's really sad that I think because there isn't any actual open funding that's really useful, people have to now compete in a way they never did in the early, in my early time as a poet. We, we just did our own things and kind of got a day job. You could get jobs. I mean, it's all changed. And... I think the committee to me is this sort of thing that that kind of runs the competition, you know, that people have to do in order to get um, to pay the rent sometimes, you know, or get some money or get some recognition. And the universities are kind of once a haven and now aren't anymore. So I think collective, I think collective and community things um, are, are positive uh, in relation to trying to alter those structures, if we can, you know. I mean, it just goes on all your life. It's not mm. like it ends. Yeah. Mm. I think um, there's so much you've said there that's kind of worth packing out, um, unpacking and kind of drawing out. Okay, um, okay go ahead. <laughs> I'll see if I can, I can see if I can pick some out because everything you were saying, my brain's just like, yes, 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 yes. I'm so glad you brought that up about um, the kind of, I think you're speaking to kind of a careerization of these modes of making art where we're sort of, mm -hmm. the way that we're living doesn't allow for a certain kind of artistic production that it used to. And so the emergence of these like neoliberal structures and um, formal kind of spaces to make a living kind of, um, yeah, like shape the way that we relate to our art practice. Um, yeah, and, because like, things, things like, um, I mean, you do have to be able to pay rent on a space, say, um, but the thing about things like the tin sheds in the old days was that that was attached to the university as an art workshop. 
it just happened to be taken over by politically minded people because that was the era. And so um, they were always fighting with the universities who exist. But now you don't even get that kind of um, space or support from the institutions. You know, they are all, you're very easily, as you were saying, institutionalised. So you become, um, you know, part of that, um, you know, you have to agree with it and you become sort of complicit in things that you'd really rather not, you know, but you need to survive. So. Yeah. Do you yeah. feel like you've resisted that institutionalization yourself? Well, in not completely. Um, in I mean, I've always tried to, when I was working, I always tried to have my own income, you know, without having to worry about funding or try to make a life because I knew that you can't really get very far as a poet trying to earn a living. Um, so I think... Uh, but institutional, I think I always, I mean, I've just um, joined the with the University of Sydney judging this huge uh, competition, you know, a women's poetry competition, and I'm ambivalent about that. You know, like I, I, it's really strange because I never enter competitions. I mean, the publisher might put your book in, but I never send poems to competitions. But I find myself being asked by people who I respect would I judge with them, you know? And so I do things like that. So I think that's a sort of mini compromise, but it's okay because we're all, it's also got a purpose for, you know, it's it's uh, for, for someone to get publication via that and get, get some funding, you know. So I think I haven't avoided in, institutions entirely. Um, I'd probably be on the street if I had. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of unavoidable. And I think, um, I think you're touching on some really kind of pertinent points about how you know we can be we can be suspicious of or critical of or kind of wary of these spaces but also recognize what things they have to offer and I, I have a I have similar kind of ambivalences to you but I also feel like if I can kind of see a good reason for something in even in the smallest sense I can understand yeah it. and it's sort of that thing of like what do you do as an individual anyway and I guess what you've spoken to and what you've done in your own practice is kind of find like different avenues and different ways through and um, alternatives, even if you can't kind of change it. Yeah, there's the thing of, I mean, I can use the example of like when I was, um, I started, I did a lot, I was going to be a librarian once, but didn't do it, but I did work in a library for a very long time. And one of the things about that was we were all busily doing our work, but also in the you know, in the uh, photocopy room, there'd be someone doing their band poster for their their uh, for their band for the weekend, or there'd be um, me doing doing a review on the desk while you know while working. And there was all this equipment you could use, which once I left the library, I missed entirely. I mean, you could make books and things at, 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 in a clandestine way. So if you can get it, if you have a sort of institutional, if you look around your institution you may find opportunities that um, your taxes have paid for if you've got a job, so why not use them? Yeah, that's a that's a really, <laughs> really good point. I think um, <laughs> we can't underestimate um, those opportunities um, mm. and need to be vigilant. Sorry, if I'm turning around quickly, it's just because I'm hearing some weird noises in my room, but it's okay. Oh. Um, it's just a ghost. It's fine. <laughs> um, uh, I think the next thing I want to ask about is sort of kind of jumping off on that last point you made and sort of your answers in that previous question, um, which is this idea of like where poetry kind of collects in these other spaces. Um, and so we've just been talking about, you know, prize culture and there's also quite major poetry publishers in this country and publications that are kind of prestigious to be published in. Um, mm. But in Australia, I think we also have some really amazing um, small outfits and DIY kind of mm. projects. Yeah. There are chapbook presses and collectives and reading series. I think um, like we've both been involved in several of these. And I think you came yes. to one of my, you must Cell. have come to my cell readings. Yeah, which yeah. I used to do yeah. in the apartment. Um, and I guess I'm sort of seeing these as like small and ephemeral um, places um and I guess like I, you've you've published in these as well and been involved and my question is um 
you you sort of said this earlier as well, but how how have you seen this culture change in the time you've been from when you were kind of in those spaces in the tin shed yeah. to now when we have things like do you think it's still possible like what are the challenges for, I mean we sort of talk about the institutional side but um yeah like how do you see this space changing if at all yeah well I mean I can go back to how I see how it's happened how we've landed where we are in that um I think uh when this is my theory when um women's writing took off in the 80s in a huge way um and I think the, the actual publishing companies that existed in Australia, I mean, the, you know, the, the real ones, um, used to use, uh, they used a lot of that. I think women made that money for them in a way. Um, and then uh, what happened was they'd do books they knew would sell and then they'd save some money and do poetry books with the, with you know, they'd make profit. And so they'd, that was a really different time. And so a lot of poets were getting published by the major publishers at that time. And not, you know, uh, the, the, the alternative publishing scene went on, like magazines and things, because it wasn't always satisfying to um, read uh, the mainstream things. And also it was things you disagree with or hate. <laughs> but I think that then what happened was publishing, as you know, went through a huge um, kind of crash in a way from from those heady days of lunches and money and funding and you know all those sorts of things and I think what happened then was that um, alongside that came creative writing classes so we had this burgeoning scene of um, younger people um, wanting to write and going to uni to learn these things rather than just do it yourself with all your friends and like read away read, read, you know, read your way through it and I think that that meant that, like, all those people were never going to be published by mainstream publishers probably or they thought they weren't or they didn't want to be. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the the kind of there was a sort of hiatus um, where there weren't, weren't many younger poets coming through, I thought, in kind of the late 80s and then suddenly people started to arrive again and it was really refreshing because we were all kind of tired of each other and um, and in that came uh, a publication um, desire for those people to you know publish their own books and so I think that's when people like you know that I've got some I wrote down like um, uh, you know Ken Bolton had one had a Poet, poetry little press called Beer Rhymes with Beer, like B-I-E-R, Coffin Rhymes with Beer, and Little Esther. And people started publishing their friends, um, their little coteries, you know, and I think that has continued on and built since then into now, and it seems to me there are a dozen, nearly every city has, mm -hmm. a, you know, a, a tiny press doing wonderful, usually really nice objects, like they make really lovely kind of books if they can afford it or if they can't they kind of would make graphics at work or good paper that they you know colored paper or something um so i think i think it's really possible still um and it's obvious that it is like and i also think booklets and chat books that are going everywhere suit this era that the, the um, internet era because what concentrations just really bad we have we all have it you know we've all got kind of distracted for years now and um so chat books are fantastic and pamphlets and things because they suit your attention span and and you can and they have incredibly long lives because you can carry them in a you know it's they're not heavy <laughs> and you can read them and so i i just i wrote a list of i just like write out a list for people who haven't heard of them of of um some of the presses that I uh, like, Bulky News, Sick Leave, Little Windows, Wagtail, Black Rider, although I think Black Rider might be defunct, um, Polar Bear Press in Sydney, Shed Under the Mountain Press, that's um, John Kinsella, Rosa Press, that you've been published by Elena, Otolith, Punch, and Puncher and Watman have started Slow Loris, which is a chapbook one, and Vagabond Press years ago. Um, about 20 years ago, started um, their Rare Object series and covered just about every poet. There was so much difference 
in uh, their selections, you know, because there were people who would never read each other, but all being published together in these fabulous looking chapbooks, you know. They were beautiful as well. They had that really kind of grainy yeah, yeah. texture paper stock. They were sort of oh, very yeah. slim. Um, yeah, I remember those. And then you, of course, were doing the Decibel series. Yes, they which am I okay? Yeah, which were um, um, small booklets in yeah ten, obviously decibel. So, I think they did about three or four, three series of that, and they were really cute little square books, beautiful yeah. um, of poets that. And that's what I think about sort of um, community too. That one of the things about it is, if you're asked to edit. Um, um, guest edit or be an editor for a magazine and you're a poet, um, you can do an awful lot for people, you know, and um, and the you can change kind of editorial things and, um, yeah, so I, I think that's a really good thing if, you, if someone invites you, don't say no. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, there's a certain kind of... There's a certain kind of way of being in these spaces where everyone's everyone's doing a bit of everything, right? Like no one's no one's mm. just an editor, no one's just publishing. It's mm. poets, mm. it's poets themselves doing these, and poets are like working with other poets. And I think that's a really kind of important part of why it works. It's it's like your friends and your peers, or your maybe you don't know someone that well, but your there's like a connection with your work, and you sort of mm. meet through your work. Mm. And, um, I think you said something earlier about, you know, kind of like little collectives of publishing each other's friends. And I feel like I I always want to emphasize to people when I talk to them, like this is a totally legitimate and absolutely like true way of making poetry is to kind of start the thing and then publish your friends. Because like that's they, like what are the stakes? Like what's the I mean, oh. yeah, like if we're that's resisting if we're resisting this kind of monolith imagined space of like esteemed work yeah. or like approved work, this is how you get around it, I think. <laughs> I don't you know. Do. Maybe. <laughs> well, the other thing is that um, people gravitate towards each other um, through readings and uh, publication and then you find a kind of, it, it, it changes, you know, it's not all fixed but you find, a, I, I call it a coterie, I think that's what it is. You find people with similar politics but usually very different um, methods and styles and so on. Like, um, you know, uh, like there's there's so many, like you can get a group of people like, I mean, I just did some work. Um, this was a, a, a group thing. We uh, AJ Carruthers, Anna Gibbs and Amanda Stewart and I um, decided we'd do the Karl Marx play, which was written by Rochelle Owens. And um, so we we wrote to Rochelle and said we want to modernise it, you know, because some of it has some what might now be considered slightly offensive um, uh, racist kind of tone. There's a bit of that because it's from way back. And she agreed and said that would be great, you know. So we set to and spent, this is about, 2018 and we spent all this time now that I call that a kind of um collective uh action you know and it just came up in a conversation because we were somewhere Andy and I were probably talking about Rachel Owens and then went oh have you seen the Karl Marx play and then went oh why don't we do that you know and then someone else was interested so we made it all and made all the masks and did all that and then Andy went off to Shanghai and we never performed it <laughs> so but that's just the the, the upshot. But um, we still, you know, worked on it for we'd meet kind of not every month, not regularly, but we'd meet all the time and, and spent like about 18 months doing that. And that was really, um, that's what I like to do, you know, work with other people on something that isn't your precious poem, you know, and, um, you know, get some, gain something from it and then present it to people who'll, who'll get something from it too, but we didn't get quite to the presentation. Yeah. That's kind of part of how these things work as well, I think. They're not, there's so many, that's what, that's part of the ephemeral kind of nature of it. Mm. Um, things mm. can kind of suddenly drop off or they become just occasional whenever something, whenever things fall in place, it just happens. Um mm. 
I think it's a good, I think it kind of is a good kind of pushback against this kind of narrative of the careerist poet, which I think. Yeah, can, I know. I mean, yeah, I, I always. Wrong, I always yeah sorry the word, the word career is just not to do with it really is it I mean I know people use it early in my career you know and I think um well no I had a job and I wrote poetry you know? <laughs> like, I didn't yeah. I don't I think it's just a uh I don't I think it's just a term I don't think people really think they have a career in poetry do they I mean no really, I don't know them if they do <laughs> Not necessarily. I guess I'm using a sort of descriptive term of kind of sort of a, a way of being a poet that kind of prioritizes prizes and publications. And not to say like there's anything wrong with that or that's bad, but just that it doesn't have to be the only way. And I think we sometimes sort of feel as though there's a certain kind of legitimization of our work that comes from those. And it's, you know, totally it, it's understandable to have that validation um but I think it also kind of I at least as someone who doesn't often enter and the few times they have doesn't do very well in in kind of submissions or competitions I feel like there's there's a space for poetry practice outside mm -hmm. of those but ones there's, that two, there's two things about the competition I mean um it does give people who it gives attention you're right validation and a sort of boost if you, you know, even if you were like the third runner up and they publish a poem. And I mean, I remember when I was young and sent a poem off and I'd get um, rejections. Um, there was this thing called Australian poetry. I had no idea what it was and sent off. And it was actually a very conservative, um, you know, <laughs> it was very conservative of the times. And they kept rejecting things. And then once I sent one to something called Hemisphere, which was a uh, an Asian Australian poem and they published it and I, I was about 17 and I went oh my god you know they've published my poem and it wasn't a very good poem but I know that that, that if if there's a way to get that that will kick you on you know for a while and you can keep writing I think it, you do need that kind of public validation I mean why do we do it I'm not sure and why do we publish I'm not sure but it's certainly um it, you know I, I remember that feeling even now that it was just great and I said to my friends look I've got this in a magazine you know <laughs> yeah there's to to have your work looked at by peers and for them to mm. say this oh. is good this is oh. a real thing and I think that it's it's not nothing um and it's an, it is an important part of um kind of the poetry world I think um yeah because that communication evolves and then you know someone else gets a spark or disagrees or whatever and mm -hmm. so you've that sort of culture being made if you like in a kind of really glib way for me to say but it is no, but it's the making of it you know these are all different kind of elements of this space like I think um like my emphasis in talking to you has been on those kind of chapbook kind of spaces and self-publishing mm. and DIY and I think just because I think that those are really interesting spaces where poetry gets made but I also feel like it's it exists alongside and in conversation with these other forms of poetry and other ways yeah. Like yeah. none of I feel like they all kind of need to be together so we can't mm. do without mm. any of them. Um, yeah, sorry, we've gone on a tangent with that. Um, but thank you. That's also really, I like that you gave us a list because it kind of harkens back to your earliest poems as a child, writing list poems. Oh, um, <laughs> even, in, even in my sort of midlife, someone said, oh, you write list poems because I think some of my longer, oh, actually they were shorter, but really skinny poems were kind of lists. And I thought, yeah, it's it's been a theme. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good theme. I think um, it's quite structurally sound about a list and it also can do a lot within it. Um, yeah, okay. Um, I would like to ask, I'm sorry, I'm just thinking I might, I might come back to this one. Um, I might ask about your poetry. So we're coming up to 10, we've got about 11 minutes left before oh, I go okay. Um, just remind if anyone has a question who's watching, feel free to jump in the chat um, through the hashtag uh, EM Toolkits. Um, 
don't have a lot of time left, so get them in quickly. Um, but I will ask you a couple of questions and then we'll get maybe the last few minutes, we'll get you to read a couple more poems for us to finish off. Okay. Um, yeah. But I want to ask, this is a big, maybe tricky question. Um, how do you write your poems? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, these days, um, they happen by obviously accretion and assembly more than kind of thinking and writing and thinking and writing. So I make fragment more fragmentary poetry now and um, sometimes I, 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 they're not quite as fragmentary, but um, I think my practice is pretty normative. Like I just do what everyone does. I think, you know, scribbling, whenever a note, uh, you know, you don't want something to, 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 to leave you. And so whenever something interesting happens, you'll make a note on whatever's available. Like I don't, I'm not particularly, uh, you know, so, so to be on like even magazine margins or wherever you are, the back of a receipt from a shop and you're on the bus or something, you know, um, it's not a, it's, but I think a lot of people do that. And then post-its and all that. And then I would take those things back home and put them on the computer or sometimes on a, piece of paper write them down and then that's when it you know you sort of rearrange add alter you have all this accumulation of notes that for me are usually not too long these days and um you cut them alter them and then the process can go on for days and weeks and months and then you might finish up with a with a poem so that's it I sort of accrete the accretion you know they grow gradually and yeah fragments rather than um and i like a lot of space these days and i always did like space on the page so i think that's some people do really fabulous dense prose no punctuation you know it's great but it's impossible for me <laughs> is there something what do you know do you have a sense of what draws you to that space in particular or is it just an aesthetic kind of like you just feel a kind of affinity for it it's really hard to talk about, isn't it? Um, it's a tricky it's, one. It's kind of, it sounds, yeah, I don't know. This sounds sort of probably a bit pompous, but it's kind of second nature, so I haven't examined how it happens. Um, That's okay. Yeah. This is still, um, no, I think this is interesting I, to hear. If, if I don't have anything, there are periods when I don't write. I mean, I don't write every day. Or, you know, I'm not disciplined in that way. And also I don't think poetry, my poetry doesn't need to do that, you know, so it's alongside life. But um, I don't, yeah, so I, it's not, um, if there's nothing to say, I'll, I'll, I won't will i say anything. I'll stop. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 There's a time for, there's a time for living. Yeah. Well, <laughs> just, it, you know, the poet, you might not be, so they might not have any 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 ideas or anything to to work with sometimes, and so I, I've sort of grown, grown to accept that rather than worry about it, which might have happened when I was younger. I, mm. And also, if you I don't know with people who publish books, like you publish a book. When you publish a book, I always find there's a period after that where you don't you don't get you don't crank up again for some time because it's all that's periods. This, the book kind of closes a period in a way. Um, even though the next thing will still be from you, <laughs> your thoughts, yeah. your mind. Yeah. Do you, is, that for you? Of... is that your Sorry. experience too? Is that your experience, Elena? Yeah, I feel like uh, even though you finish writing it long before it comes out because it goes through proofs and yes. then you're sitting with it for a long time and you're tinkering and it's sort of taking its form and then it comes out, I think... Uh, yeah, there's something about it kind of occupying. I feel like I'm always right inside that space and I can't necessarily mm -hmm. yeah. see yeah. other things. But I was maybe writing my second book while I was doing that with the first book, but it was different because it was like um, it was a collection versus like a new yeah. Yeah. book. But you have said in the past, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that you have been a poet who works on multiple poems at once is that changed now yeah yeah, yeah that must have been the shorter ones no it's um yeah. 
now well i don't know how long it's going to how long these things are going to be anymore and um i usually no no oh there may be a couple of oh there may be some that aren't working <laughs> that i should probably go back to that i could call working on a couple of things at once but um no i think it's more the accretion is what's happening yeah. to me these days you know yeah yeah it's amazing yeah. to sort of hear how your how your kind of practice has evolved over the years i think that's um that's really valuable for poets listening to kind of get a sense of because I think sometimes we I have in the past thought of myself as someone who just like had this thing that they needed to like this imagined idea of what I need to get out and I'm always chasing that but that <laughs> thing, it's always changing and you never get it and mm. I think just like accepting that it just changes over time is a much kind of yeah. more pleasant way. yeah and also uh what you're saying i mean if you if you stay alive long enough you know it's bound to um bound to change because everything else is too yeah 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 thank you um okay so we have about five minutes left do you think that's enough time for you to read another poem? So. you can read a couple if you want see how long they are but love to um, it out with some number of palm down poems Actually, I've just got one, which is probably about five or something, or four maybe. Um, yeah. See how we go. Okay? Okay. Yeah. It's called Rehab for Everyone. Fingers cold, tucked under legs, sitting in an insect hiss, low white noise, gas heater undertone, no other sound. Almost asleep, a car pulling up the hill. A karawong does that shrill thing into pink air. A huge open yawn almost breaks my jaw. The pen that makes the marks alters the angles of the letters. A patch of yesterday's chocolate stuck to my corduroy sleeve, a signal imagined and interpreted. We look back at the years in the tops waiting to be taken out of time. Red brick, wall map of Australia, grass green carpet, mustard colored plastic chairs, clumpy pilling on the mittens, mitts on the keyboard, pushing thoughts and jingles out to D Dublin, to Seattle, Adelaide, Kaneohe, Atlanta, Glebe. Sadly notating dim trivia, me minus you, outside community. Literary festivals can't help anyone, like a rehab book sale making mistakes so different from being morally wrong. It's a rabbit life. Build the walls from castrol cases. Black tie ribbons strewn like a giant's licorice under the striated cutting siding on the highway. Say goodbye to the Woodford Bends. Sometimes the clunky can incandesce, but I want to know how to vitalise gawkiness. Sometimes I'm in my no mind sometimes in a technological mindlessness, somewhere nowhere near limbo, although that's unusual. Some people just float along all the time, accumulating the placid. Sometimes when you think you're going down, you're not. You're going straight ahead to a utopia of modernity. It finished with a punchline. Finished with the punchline. Sorry, I was just, uh, yeah, that was amazing. Thank you. Um, I had, I had to do that anymore. <laughs> no, no, but this is this is a treat. We got the punchline <laughs> um, of uh, yesteryear poem. Um, I also had to write down how to vitalize gawkiness because I just really love it. I but wonder. there was so many. <laughs> Let's try. <laughs> so good. Okay, we are nearly out of time, so I'm and I don't okay. know how. Uh, sorry, no, but that was an amazing poem to finish on. Thank you so much. Um, so I just want to finish by saying um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you so much, Pam. Um, so you've got another book coming out in November. What's that one I called? Think so. I think so. It's been waiting two years. 
It, yeah, right. Stasis Shuffle. I think it'll Stasis come out. We might, right. even have a, we might even have a tiny book launch. That would be amazing. That would be incredible. Ooh. I hope you get yeah. to do that. Thank you. Um, so all the Toolkits live sessions from this year are also available on the Express Media YouTube. And this session will also be available. Um, and it's going to be captioned in the coming days um, if you'd like to come back to it. Um, but yeah, this has been a really, um, really beautiful session and just hearing about your experience of poetry and sharing with us all of your, um, kind of. Well, thank, thank you, Elena, for inviting me. I've, I've enjoyed it. I, I was a little bit, uh, apprehensive, of course, and now I feel quite relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thanks so much. I'm so glad. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.